Hi, I'm Megan Buchter. I'm the director of the Fowler Center for Business as an Agent of World Benefit at the Weatherhead School of Management at Case Western Reserve University. At the Fowler Center, we run a program called Aim to Flourish. It's a globally used program that helps to teach students about the UN Global Goals and businesses' role in achieving them. As part of the assignment, students conduct interviews of business leaders, social entrepreneurs, um, all over the world, and then do write-ups of those interviews of those companies that are then published on the Aim to Flourish website. So you can check out almost 3,000 published stories that we have on our website, aim2flourish.com. Every year, we take all of the stories that are published um, during the calendar year, and we do the annual Flourish prizing process. So after an evaluation process and a a jury that looks at all of the stories, we end up with 17 winners, one for each of the UN Sustainable Development Goals. And today I am with our group of honorees from global goal number 16, Peace, Justice, and Strong Institutions. So I have with me today, Professor Ron Dufresne from St. Joseph's University, um, our student authors, James, Anna, and Rose, and our business leader for Humblebee Consulting, Emily Weiner. Thank you so much to everybody for being here with me today. Ron, I'd like to start with you and ask you if you can tell us all a little bit about how you've used Aim to Flourish in your course, how it's used at St. Joseph's University, and some of the outcomes that you've seen from that experience. Yeah, happy to, Megan. And, and first off, thank you so much for this opportunity. Uh, working with the Fowler Center um, and Aim to Flourish has been really a great opportunity uh, for, for St. Joe's and, and for our students. Um, so we've been using um, the Aim to Flourish assignment for our students now for the past few years, and we've integrated it with our senior capstone course. Uh, so we have a, an undergrad program that's called Leadership, Ethics, and Organizational Sustainability. And the idea of the program is to help students learn more thoughtful leadership uh, about how to make the world a better place uh, through, through business. Uh, and the capstone class is built around really two projects. The first project is a, a, a B Corp ass assessment and consul uh, consulting project with a local company and uh, student teams will find a local company and uh, through the B lab assessment, uh, help uh, uh, collect data to uh, learn how, how effective or ineffective maybe some parts of the company might be, and then to provide some suggestions uh, to, to that partner company. And then we, we also, uh, the students also engage in the appreciative inquiry interview with a business leader at that uh, organization to learn more about uh, just capturing just the greatness that's happening out there. Um, so our students will, will have a formal interview with, with a partner uh, at, the, at the company and uh, just learn more about what, what they're doing that, that is part of their, their normal practice uh, that are making their communities, their, uh, their uh, area better to their work, to their project. Um, so our, our students will do the interview and then write the uh, the case study. And it's just a great opportunity for the students to, to be able to capture and formalize their lessons and also graduate having published a, a business case, which is kind of a pretty cool feature for our students. Yeah, that's definitely uh, one of the, the highlights of the program is getting to see your work published out there on the internet and you know share it as much as possible. So uh, Anna, James, Rose, Maybe one of you would like to comment on your experience writing or doing the Aim to Flourish assignment, conducting the interview, writing the story, um, and how that fit in with your the capstone course that you took at St. Joseph's. Yeah, um, I mean, I remember going through uh, the process of trying to find the companies that we were trying to partner with was a little bit difficult at first. Um, it was, I remember a lot of the groups were having troubles um, in the beginning of the year trying to partner up, especially, you know, we're students in college and a lot of companies, they got work to do. So half the time, they didn't really want to hear from us. Um, but we were fortunate enough to meet Emily and to work with her and doing the case study on Humblebee. And um, for me, at least, I, I, I thought it was a different experience. Um, been around a lot of formal workplaces in my time and having to like work with Emily in the co-op when we were working with her, um, doing the evaluation. That was definitely a cool experience to kind of see how different work environments um, work throughout just even just the city of Philadelphia, but just anywhere in general. Um, but with that, like the actual um, process of going over the B lab and doing the assessment was pretty long. I, I remember taking 
I, I did, we did power it through one sitting, but it took pretty long time. A couple, I'd say like four or five hours, right? If I, if I remember. Is the, is the B-Lab assessment and the aim to flourish assignment done about the same company? Yes. Oh, okay. Fun. Yeah, no. And then after we did the B, B lab assessment, um, and when we did go to write up the article, it was kind of cool putting it all together and seeing like how the different parts of the value evaluation went with kind of our interview questions and whatnot. So, but definitely a great experience overall. Great. Um, Anna Rose, before I let you respond, Ron, when your students have trouble finding a company, what, what do you do to support them with that? You just tell them like you'll find one eventually or is there is there some other way that I don't often hear from students from St. Joseph's coming to me. So I'm curious how you how you get them to find the companies eventually. So our, our students, um, that's part of the challenge is to, to yeah. uh, get our students out there and to find the companies that are doing the, the meaningful work. And um, as James mentioned, uh, have the bandwidth to engage in, in this work um, and and it's not that un unfrequent, uh, not that not that uncommon uh, for um, there to be a, a kind of an inverse relationship between like impact work and time to spend with students. Uh, so we have we have a lot of companies that express an interest to say, yeah, we're happy to to help help you, but just not now. Um, and it's really tough, in fact, on the academic uh, calendar schedule uh, to to kind of thread that needle. Um, which is why, like, we're, we're, I mean, I remember at the time just being so psyched when, when uh, the student team found Emily and found Humblebee and found a, a ready and willing partner to, to um, collaborate in, in the learning work. Um, so, yes, it, it, it can be challenging to, to find a partner. But when, when we find good partners, they're, they, they're really gems. Yeah, they're worth it. Yeah. Um, Emily has a really great story to share. But before we get to that, I want to give Anna and Rose a chance to to talk, tell us a little bit about their Aim to Flourish experience. Yeah, I mean, I would definitely agree with what James said and Dr. Dufresne about, um, I would I found the most extensive part of the project was finding someone to work with. And I think our whole class would probably agree on that. And that's probably what we had the most discussion on. And I think that was an interesting thing to take away from this whole thing is how are you gonna pitch um, this project, this idea to folks who maybe don't quite get it or have never heard of of what we're talking about, um, or are, have time concerns, like James said. Um, and so I, I think that all, um, I think that experience in and of itself, like changed how we pitched our ideas. And we talked, uh, I think we spent an hour one day in class, just talking about how we can put the onus on ourselves and say, you know, we're happy to meet wherever you want, whenever you want, um, you know, really accommodating the folks we were working with, which is, I think something now that we've all been in, the real world, if you will, for more than a year, like I think we see firsthand and especially in the pandemic as well. Um, I, I mean, I'm sure we're going to get into Emily and Humblebee a little bit more, but like Emily is the perfect person and Humblebee is the perfect uh, business for this project because she like accommodates to everyone and that's what you need in order to meet some of these sustainability goals, right? Like you need someone who's going to be conscious of what they're doing. And Humblebee is consistently conscious um, about their impact on the community, about their impact on the folks they're working with, um, on the physical space they're in, um, that kind of thing. So, yeah. Thank you so much, Anna. Rose? Yeah, um, both James and Anna really put it in a really great light, but um, I will just add that I was like a leadership ethics and organizational sustainability major. And so now after being in the real world for a year or two, a lot of people are like, I don't even know what that means. Um, can you like, what did you study? And so a lot of times, like as a student going through, I would just be like, oh, you know, we, we do case studies and we, we look at companies like the Ben and Jerry's and the, the Unilever's and the Patagonia's of the world. Um, so being a senior in this capstone course and then being able to find a company like Humblebee that's right in our own backyard in Philadelphia, it definitely brought the whole experience um, full force, very well-rounded. So that being said, um, in the major of leadership ethics and organizational sustainability, we talk a lot about just the perspectives on leadership and how to build that um, as a manager overseeing other people. And so the fact that Humblebee's, like the, the fact that Humblebee's 
like central theme to the company is being able to instill those same um, those same lessons into the businesses that she's working with. It was it, it just it made so much sense and it was almost like meant to be. Um, and I remember I was so excited to tell Dr. D, um, yeah, I know she like she does improv classes like she she's giving these businesses all the tools and all the manage and the managers the, the, the tools that they need in order to succeed. So um, that being said, it was a really great fit. And I think it was a really great way for all of us to graduate leaving um, now being able to say not only are we, work, are we like overseeing and like studying the Ben and Jerry's of the world, but we're also studying the humblebees of the world. like. The, the silent majority of businesses that exist. It is really nice to be able to make that connection between kind of the larger companies that are doing this, the more the more well-known companies and somebody that's in your own community. Um, I think that, that that connection is really invaluable. And I also, Ron, I think it's wonderful all of the other skills that you have brought into this capstone experience, teaching your students how to pitch themselves, probably talking about, you know, interviewing skills and ways to interact with a business leader when you're when you're meeting with them. Um, I think that that's really great to be able to bring those different aspects into this assignment. And it's it's so uh, it's difficult for for students because they are um, last semester, you know, seniors. So very commonly, our students are also looking for jobs. And our, I mean, the students at St. Joseph's are just rock stars. Like they, these are amazing students that I'm just so blessed to be able to work with. And there's, it's still stressful, it's still stressful to be a college student yeah. looking for a job. Um, and I, I, we try to frame the, the, the project, both the, the B lab project, as well as the, the aim to flourish, uh, project through the lens of just a real, real world challenge that you're, you're going to run to people that will see that something's a good idea. But to, to move them from having a, seeing it as a good idea to something that they want to take action on, it can be a challenge. And as, as Anna said, you know, we, we spent time in class, just how, how, do we, how do we try to take someone's perspective, speak their language to them to convince them that this is a good thing that, that they can do both for themselves and very much like a, a humble bees kind of, you know, business model in the, in, in the first place, how to actually use the business as a broader force for good to include helping these great students, you know, learn and grow. Um, so it really is a, a great, you know, quote unquote, real world project um, to help students, you know, build those skills on their way out the door. Well, Emily, we've heard such wonderful things about you and your company and are all, including myself, so appreciative of the fact that you've participated in this Hopefully, um, you can tell us a little bit more about Humblebee Consulting. Maybe what what ins what did your company do? What inspired you to create this organization? I heard the words improv, so that sounds really fun. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you, Megan, for the invitation. And um, I'll just be here blushing for a little while. Those were such high praise words. My goodness, <laughs> um, I it's it's been a privilege to be part of the project for sure. Um, so, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm Emily Weiner. Uh, I'm the founding partner of Humblebee. We're a small consultancy, Philadelphia-based, uh, that's focused on organization development, lots of capacity building and expansion work, particularly with uh, nonprofit organizations and cooperative or other progressive enterprises. Um, that can look like a lot of different things. I'd say our niche is uh, in facilitation, meaningful, inclusive facilitation, uh, both doing it directly and also coaching leaders on how to do it um, themselves. Um, and, and with that, I think it's also, it's interesting because I'm holding a lot of empathy for what James, Rose, Anna described as the experience of even getting in touch with a business leader. Um, because I'm realizing and thinking back uh, that, you know, it was also a tremendous service to me to have a whole you know, B lab assessment done to know like what are the areas where I'm performing well, what are what are areas where I could improve or could consider in a in a uh, in a growth or internal operation sense. Um, so it was a great service to me, and I know I think in my daily practice as a as the founding partner with Humblebee, how often I encounter situations where organizations or leaders um, don't even know what they need or what they could need, or or they like have an inkling of like. Like Dr. Dufresne said, like that would be a good idea, but ah, can I make room for it, right? And 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 then I'm just there to say, I'm ready when you know you're ready, um, right? And so I, I empathize a bit 
with the sense of, you know, <laughs> as a student doing that project, um, really wanting to get in the door with someone where I'm often in that role of like, I really want to get in the door with this organization or company because like, I think I could actually really support y'all in in digging through some of your your challenges and your um, communication practices and like lots of this team mess that actually has some like very simple ways that we could improve this. Um, but I can't force my way in, you know, you have to want it too in order for it to be successful. So um, I was very grateful that James and Rose and Anna reached out and it ended up being a beautiful thing for me too. That's wonderful. Um, and really nice to hear what inspired you to start Humblebee Consulting? Where are the, where are the origins of this? Um, you know, my early career was spent in nonprofit organizations and I would say quite pivotally, um, there were a few years I spent at a very large public health institution, um, with, you know, over 200 client or community facing programs. Um, many of these, you know, quote unquote, frontline or ground level, entry level employees having, in my opinion, some of the hardest jobs in the world, right? Like powerful, deep, meaningful work, um, engaging with folks who may be houseless and HIV positive and needing public health services or having gone through a trauma or um, navigating child welfare systems. Um, with high caseloads and, you know, there's, there's burnout and turnover and all this stuff. And I um, had the, the great fortune, the great challenge of being put at a rather young age in a role to say, okay, uh, can we help all of these 200 plus client and community facing programs uh, work better together? And for me, it was a real crash course in organizational complexity in change um, and many of the lessons were really complicated, but many of them were also really, really simple um, in that, you know, I, uh, there, was, there was a lot of tension around sometimes senior leadership wanting to push XYZ initiative that folks actually doing the direct work on the ground were thinking, that's not how this works, right? That's not going to make sense. Please don't trickle that down to me. Um, and so in some ways, there's a lot of complexity there, right? Of like, what are the, the burdens, the responsibilities that senior leaders are holding? What are the ground level awarenesses that employees are holding? A lot of complexity there, but also a great deal of simplicity in the task of bring folks together. Just bring folks together, get them in the same room, get them talking together. Often we all want the same thing or something that's similar um, and we might have really different takes on how to get there, but starting from a place of common ground rather than opposition, um, starting from a place of meaning, of purpose, of connection, um, can really be helpful. And some of that takes real skills. So in this, like, you know, my, my crash course learning in that role at the Public Health Institute, I was like, whoa, there's a lot here. There's a lot here about how we can support folks with the, the tools, the skills in how to communicate in ways that are honest, that are direct, and that are also kind, that adopt a, a growth mindset, a learner's mindset, that are compassionate, that take perspective. Um, folks don't like to be communicated in ways where it puts us in a threat response, right? So as I was, I was going through this crash course professional experience, um, I'd also picked up a, a certificate in applied positive psychology, equipping my own tool belt uh, to be able to support all of these actors. Um, and, and those were the, the days where like the seeds sort of came, right? Of like, I imagine there are a number of organizations um, that could use this, that could use the lessons on how do we come together? How do we communicate better together? Um, how can we do really like inclusive facilitation? Um, and, and recognize that that upfront investment will actually pay off in dividends and dividends and dividends individually, emotionally, organizationally, um, and beyond. So those, those were the early seeds. Um, there have been points of evolution along the way, but um, that, was, that was definitely the original inkling. I feel like I could sit here and listen to you and nod all day. Um, <laughs> James and Anna and Rose, you must have, I mean, what an honor to get to work with 
with somebody like this for this this project. <laughs> yeah, no, definitely. I, I I remember meeting Emily in the elevator, and it was uh, I'd I'd never been in a, one of those buildings in Center City like that, so it was definitely like a little intimidating going into like one of those bigger city or bigger buildings down in Center City, and then when we got up into the co-op room and the open space, and then we finally got a chance to sit down and talk, like it was definitely a relaxing and like definitely an informative experience that we we start from start to finish. It was great. <laughs> yeah, um, I'll just say that to that too. Again, it was just such a perfect fit because Emily also, since she pretty much is self-run, um, it was really easy to be able to schedule and to be able to be flexible with like all of our different student schedules as well as her own. Or if we needed something real quick, she was always very responsive. Um, and it, it was really cool to kind of be seen, even though we were a student group, to be seen almost as like equals to her. Like you could tell that the same the same relationship that she was giving to us is definitely the same relationship that she gives to her clients as well. Um, so it was just very professional and it was a really great way for, you know, us student leaders to see how, like how an effective organization is run. Um, that no matter, you know, how successful or how big or how However much you grow, you're able to still give back to, you know, the smaller student groups or to the smaller businesses that you're working with, just the same as you would to the more important clients. Yeah, I mean, I agree with what both those folks said. Um, and, and just that, like, we're studying, like, theories of leadership each and every day. And, and for Rose, who was a major and I was a minor, um, you know, we'd taken multiple courses before. So we had applied theory from other classes as well as what we were doing in our capstone project. And now we were got, kind of getting to see what that looked like in the flesh and like what one approach to that looked like and an approach that I found to be effective the, the way that Emily leads um, and just like the way she brings herself to the table, you know, there, I mean, as we said, the evaluation took like, I think it was five hours in total that it took. And we were all frustrated by the end of it because we're like, when I thought we were close, I thought we were close. It's like that thing when you're like, oh, the next question, and then we'll be there. And then, you know, so, um, the, the amount of patience she had to have with us. And, and I mean, we all had to have with each other. Um, like Rose said, you can see how she would bring that as well to her clients. And the other thing is that I think sometimes we have really stiff interpretations of of leadership, but also specifically business leadership. And Emily just knocks all of those out of the park. You know, she um, is very much her own person, of course, but, um, you know, we equally respected her and and looked to her and, and listened to her the entire time. Um, and that's a great way to kind of end your educate formal educational experience and then go out into the world and say, OK, like I could do that. I could be that or I can look for that um, in the people that I look up to um, in the future. That's so kind. These words are overwhelming, y'all. <laughs> um, so truly, though, and I, I appreciate um, Rose and Anna, the way you're articulating what I hope comes off as true, that I you know, approach you or anyone uh, the same way I would a client, you know, with great care, with a listening ear, with compassion and openness. Um, And that is a deep-seated belief of Humblebee, right? It is a deep-seated belief that how we show up matters. Um, If there's someone in the world who's curious about doing good in doing business, who wants to make impact, who wants to center racial and economic justice in all of our roles and hats that we wear. Um, It's important for me to say yes to that conversation as a gesture of affirmation, as a gesture of thank you and appreciation. You're on the right track. We're in this together. Um, And so, yeah, I I just, I deeply mean that. Um, And that does show up in terms of what my approach to even marketing has been with Humblebee marketing. And I'll I'll say in air quotes, I talk all the time about how I am far, 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 far from a marketing expert. Um, And I am deliberately letting that remain true. (laughs) I could, I could go forth and try to learn or gain skills or, you know, hire someone to do marketing. Or I could say, actually, you know, the way that um, I want to grow Humblebee's presence and recognition, um, our, our base of prospective clients, is to offer, to just keep offering what we want to offer in a paid sense, right? So, you know, I 
week, I have an upcoming workshop at the Free Library in Philadelphia around transformative practices in fundraising. Um, because that's what that's something we like to do. And so might as well bring folks in with a free offering with a taste. Um, and at minimum, it means great. Lots of other people know how to show up in fundraising relationships with higher integrity and kindness um, and relationship. And perhaps that will also lead to someone saying, oh, I'd actually really like to be in deeper relationship with Humble Bee, and I think we could go further and, and contract with them for some more skill building. And that'd be great too. But uh, the point all throughout is like, are we, are we sharing skills? Are we holding an abundance mindset that, you know, the world just needs this. So we're going to keep putting it out there and we'll keep building uh, in the variety of ways. And I've, I've really enjoyed... Um you know, in, in the role and in this, listen, I, I, I had the easiest job ever because I didn't do any work. Um, I just gave assignments and then the students did all the work. Um, and it's, it's very important to note that we have two other amazing students that couldn't be with us um, on this call. So we had Megan Baker and Jackie DeVuono, um, who are also on the, the authorship team of, of the case and worked on the project uh, along with Anna and James and, and Rose. Um, so my, you know, my job is easy you know, just uh, encourage the students and then just bask in their, in their awesomeness. Um, and, and as an audience member, really front row audience member, um, it's just really cool to, to, uh, to experience a company that in fact uh, has integrity and integrity. I, I mean, in the way I don't just mean promise keeping and truth telling, I mean, having a wholeness. So having the wholeness of saying um, as, as Emily does it, through Humblebee, of promoting peace and justice in her communities through her work and doing so in a peaceful and just way. And to me, that's just really remarkable. And it's, it's such a, a great exemplar for, for our students and, and through the Aim to Flourish case to, to uh, share that story with others that, you know, we, we need to have that integrity. If, if, we, if we want to lead to a world that, ha that promotes gender equality, we have to treat people with gender equality at work. Um, so that this is what it's just an amazing uh, 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 set of practices in a very thoughtful way. And this, this is my, my favorite leadership word is, as our students will tell you, um, uh, the highest praise that, that I might offer anyone in their leadership is that they're, they're thoughtful, you know, that they're mindful over how they what work they're doing, how they're doing it and how everything fits together. So, Ron, you made a comment that I've kind of been thinking about myself um, in, a, in a way. So, you know, this story uh, we're highlighting it for Global Goal 16, which is peace, justice, and strong institutions. And what I love about Humblebee Consulting and Emily's story is that it's not just that Humblebee represents peace, justice, and a strong institution, but that you're actually helping other organizations exemplify that themselves. Um, so I really feel like your impact here is twofold and it is so relevant. I know the story was written in 2019, but it's it's maybe even more relevant today um, to really be helping organizations with that task. That's very real. <laughs> uh, and I feel it deeply, the relevance of the work. Um, yeah, I think I remember chatting with Rose and James and Anna about the the pipe dream of Humblebee to become a worker owned cooperative, um, which in, there's a variety of reasons we could unpack as to buy a worker co-op. Um, uh, you know, there's a variety of reasons there. And in these times right now, um, and especially in terms of this high integrity aim of, you know, really operating in a way within my company that I'm inviting other institutions, organizations, companies to operate or to consider operating. It's a matter of aligning the practice, right? So worker cooperatives are a very direct form of democratic practice, small d. Day-to-day, <laughs> um, -day, you know, participating in decision-making and ownership. Um, so I'm, I'm excited about that future. That's great. So I'm wondering if um, maybe just for fun, for my benefit, if you can give an example of something that you do with the company. I know you mentioned improv. Um, can you give me an example of, of kind of how you work with an organization? Sure. 
one example of a, of a client project maybe has been <laughs> a nonprofit organization coming our way to say, hey, you know, we, we're thinking about ways to redesign one of our core programs. Uh, this is a, a theater organization, an arts organization. We're thinking about ways to redesign um, our core program. We're a small staff. We've got like four folks, but our program impacts hundreds. Um, we'd like to be centering equity in uh, in this program more. We have some ideas on how. Can you can you help us? Um, and what that turns into, what it did turn into, was first like a you know a bit of a deeper introductory conversation, and then me saying, well, you know, I think I appreciating all that they are coming with, right? Appreciating all the curiosity, the desire to involve folks in in this future visioning, and to say, great, you know, I think what Humble Bee can do is we can help you um, design and then actually directly facilitate some multi-stakeholder community forums to actually be able to to vision and talk through some of these options that you're considering um, and really get input. Again, this is a theater organization, so we're talking about stakeholders who are arts administrators, performers, other creatives, um, audience members, lay folks, people who like the arts, funders, right? And bringing all those folks together to say, here's what's on the table, here's what we're trying to do, help us think through this. Um, and it was great, and the awards show last year after they operationalized all this stuff uh, it was really, really profoundly beautiful. So, so that's one example um, uh, where we're actually then directly doing the thing. Other times, it might be that we're facilitating or offering some real skill building, right? So I just um, co-facilitated a couple leadership development sessions um, with a group of physici physician leaders, doctors um, based in California, actually, on um, good practices in uh, communication and facilitation for themselves, right? These are doctors who um, often share case studies with one another. They're, of course, doctors who have their own direct caseload uh, with mostly virtual visits going on now. There's like a totally different thing happening relationally. Um, so in that sense, that was, you know, a whole health system coming to us saying, help, <laughs> help us communicate a little better, uh, help us adapt to this virtual reality um, and, and, and still be able to, you know, hit our metrics and hit our goals of, uh, of compassionate care for our patients. So, um, so in that sense, that's a very direct uh, skill building opportunity that they can then replicate and go forward and use. The improv thing is <laughs> a bit of a, um, another niche of humble bees. I'll be frank and say we're doing it less these days, um, but I am a trained improviser, uh, and we humble bee has often uh, brought improv in to do team development sessions. Right? There's lots of lessons in improv around how do you how do you say yes and <laughs> to your colleagues, to your coworkers. Right? A lot of that in an improv sense is about building a beautiful scene. A lot of that in a work sense is about just validating someone else's ideas or contributions and saying, yes, and can I help you? Yes, and how do we bring this forth? Um, and so there's lots of lessons to be gleaned and we, we often use some actual improv exercises with teams um, you know, to bring out fun, it helps loosen people up and then we say, okay, and now why did that matter? And why? why would this matter for you at work? Um, like I said, I'll, uh, you know, we're, we're doing a touch less of it these days in part uh, because it's a personal preference to not do it virtually. <laughs> there are some magnificently skilled applied improvisation practitioners out there who have really adapted to the virtual setting. I, as a, as a off the charts extrovert, need the in-person people energy. So it's just not quite the same. And I think we're often finding some clients not... Um, maybe not in as playful of a space. And so again, part of our approach as Humble Bee is, is to recognize and honor that existence, right? I'm not gonna try to force a product or service when it's just, it's not matching the cultural tone of this moment and what's going on, right? We really need to meet you where you're at. So we're doing that a little less these days, perhaps, you know, once we all save democracy, we can go back to playing a little bit more. <laughs> and I think that, right there is evidence of how like perfect of a match Emily was for us because in one of Dr. Dufresne's courses, I believe I took it my junior year, he 
he does improv. He bring he brings in theater folks and we do improv and we played the yes and game. Like I can see the classroom in my head right now. I vividly remember okay. this. Um, and so like if there wasn't any more like magic in this space, like there you go. Okay. Like we're doing the same things. So okay, so I'd love to ask you all, how do you bring the spirit of improv to your life? This this entire uh you know, trying to teach in the age of COVID has been a nonstop um, yes and uh, game. Um, you know, we can't change the context. And that's 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 uh, been the number one leadership lesson for me personally. And certainly I try to share with our, our current students um, that, you know, the, the question is, how do we respond to the context? So you can't change, you know, and I know, I know nothing about improv. Um, which is blessed to bring in some uh, student improv team members and they, they run the class for me. Um, if, if, if you're missed, if not picking up the theme yet, uh, all I do is I, I, I work with amazing people and then just sit around and watch. Um, so, you know, this, this, this whole semester has been just accepting the context for what it is and then bringing the, the, that's the yes. Now the and is what, what do we do next? I guess kind of to jump off that a little bit, um, maybe, maybe it's a little bit less improv and more adaptability for myself nowadays. Um, especially like I work in a setting where I, I'm in HR now and I have to work from home and I have to communicate with people out in the field. And like the most difficult part is like, is handling a situation that you would normally want to be there for someone like in the physical, but then you're kind of blocked off by the screen and more, more cases than not, you're blocked off by the ability of someone not having a camera. So like being adaptable in this time and like being able to shift the direction, how you do work and like how other people might be affected in during this time and how they do their own work. It's just being a little bit more cognizant of that and like being a little bit more aware of how everybody's kind of moving around nowadays. I didn't think about this initially, but now that I've been sitting here, like I can see how I kind of improv in the, in, in my work as well. I work as a journalist and um, it's really interesting now being at home, like when I'm only really calling folks on the phone, I'm not meeting them in person as much, how I have to kind of read their tone right off the bat and see how I'm going to approach a call based off of like a hi, hello, who are you type thing, which is very little to judge a person off of. Um, but it's also, I think, kind of, I mean, like Dr. Dufresne said, you're kind of meeting them where where they're at. So like I, I approach each one of those interactions very differently um, and, and, and you also take kind of what you know about people. Um, and I think that's, that's what the yes and really helps with, you know, um, I remember using that, the yes and tool a lot when I was, um, an editor at our college newspaper, um, for folks who I know knew were very, very sensitive. Um, and, and you had to frame any kind of feedback positively, or you would get a, a really rough reaction. Yes. And, you know, you had to constantly be thinking about how you were going to going to respond to those folks. And that's fine. Like I, you're you're going to have folks like that in the real world as well. But it was just helpful to have that interaction, I guess, earlier on in in my life. So now I'm very wary of that. Um, and, and I wouldn't have been that conscious if I didn't have that kind of yes and mentality to go off of. Otherwise, I think I kind of would have just been floating aimlessly. Yeah, jumping off of both of what James and Anna just said, especially using Yes And right now, but working virtually over Zoom just on a daily basis. Um, I work with students. I'm a college success coach down in Austin, Texas. Um, so I oversee a caseload of about 80 students. And so getting them to interact with me on one Zoom call or like on a few different Zoom calls a week, all of them come on, they have their cameras off, they're already muted, they don't want to be there. And so I would say yes and comes across in my line of work because when I'm getting them to interact and when I do see something in the chat pop up or when one of them, you know, unmutes themselves and actually speaks, it's actually being present and being like, yes, thank you so much for talking about that, even if it wasn't relevant to what the activity that we were doing or if it was just like a random question about something that I had already went over. It's just like praising them for interacting with me, period. Like that's where the bar is right now. And then going from there and running with it um, because just making them feel comfortable and valued by their participation, it kind of creates the whole environment. The rest of the, it kind of ignites the rest of the environment to do the same. Um, so definitely yes stand right now working over Zoom is essential because otherwise people just won't participate because there's such a shield right now that we could totally all put on. Yeah, that's so powerful. 
I hear in that a lot of just um, building on what's already working, right? Like you get a nugget that works, great. Praise it, lift it up. <laughs> More people will add on. And on a, your, the, the yes piece being so critical to just saying yes to someone else's reality, right? Um, like Dr. Dufresne said, you can't change the context. I can't change can't change the context of what someone else is showing up with. Um, I can't change if my fellow stage player said a ridiculous line that I was deeply unprepared for. I can change what I do next, <laughs> right? Um, so that's the um, adaptability that you were talking about, James, right? Just being able to shape shift. So, so powerful. Thanks for sharing that, y'all. It really says to me how much working with Emily has really and being a part of Ron's class has really impacted the three of you as you've moved on out of school into, you know, whatever's been next for you. So that's a really nice story to be able to tell. Um, does anybody have anything else that they want to add? Any other questions that they want to ask? Anything that they feel was missed? There was one thing I did want to add, um, and not that it neatly fit anywhere in our line of questioning, but just something that came across in, in my head when we mentioned Patagonia and Ben and Jerry's. I mean, for those folks to make substantial change, like it takes more than one person to be intentionally, thoughtfully, like sitting down and changing the way, you know, an organization functions. And I think it's pretty clear that when like Emily started all of this, she was in, uh, making intentional decisions. And yes, that is easier to do because Emily is is, is kind of just Emily at, at Humblebee right now. And, and that's fine. It still takes time. It still takes a lot of effort. And Emily could have done things a lot easier and she actively chose not to do that. And um, I, I think like that's where we're going to see some type of like widespread change in terms of how we run organizations and how people run other people. Um because Emily, I mean, I mean, and Emily's conducive to showing that to other folks because of her line of, of work um, and because so many people can see how she operates and how she teaches and take some of those things and bring them back. Um, and I'll just say like one specific thing on on that thread. When, when we sat down with Emily and we came out of those elevator doors, like James said, and we sat at this like long table in like before hour one even hit, um, Emily sat down, she introduced herself and... Um, she introduced herself and said what her pronouns were. And that was the first time in a professional setting that I had seen someone do that. Um, and so I think that, I mean, and, and we're in higher, we're like we're in ed higher education, we're on a college campus where some, some of those types of things will kind of flow, I think a little bit more naturally. And so to see that in a work setting was awesome because, you know, I, I guess it kind of shows you like that, that can happen in, in a work setting where I am when I introduce myself first next. I'm so glad that stuck with you. It's <laughs> great. And I think I think an, another thing that has come to my mind, um, and and Rose mentioned it a, a little while ago, the idea of, of the majority. Um, you know, the reality is that that the vast majority of the businesses in at least the United States and probably worldwide are small. Um, so for as much as you know, especially our business schools spend a lot of time doing case studies on on really big, very well known uh, companies because they, they kind of attract students' attention. I mean, there's a good reason for it. Everyone loves to learn about what Google's doing at Microsoft or, or whoever, you know, other, you know, massive company. And the reality is that the majority of businesses are small sole proprietorships or, you know, small deli or, you know, the mom and pop literal type places um, that for us to actually work toward a more hopeful shared future, we can't wait till Google solves the world's problems because they won't. Um, it really does boil down to, to looking for, and this is where that appreciative inquiry part of the Aim to Flourish uh, project is so important. You know, look for the goodness because it's out there. You know, celebrate and, and spend our dollars at that, that local company that is doing good, thoughtful, meaningful work. Um, you know, pick, pick the painter that gives their painters benefits um, mm -hmm. rather than just being pure contact, uh, contract work. Um, mm -hmm. So, you know, that's, that's, that's what I think is a really powerful lesson of, of this project, certainly, and certainly in, in this conversation, you see that the power of, of you know, so the, the end of one, what, what can one person do to change the world? It turns out it's a lot, um, because you multiply that one person times every uh, shopping choice that we make, it's, it's, a, it's a huge set of, of impacts. Ron, I couldn't have said it better myself. <laughs> so 
Thank you. And um, that is one of the reasons why I am so proud of our Aim to Flourish program, because we get to highlight all of these different sizes of companies. And because it is up to the students to find something and someone that really connects with them and speaks to their passion. Um, and we're not dictating, you know, the specific type of company or size of company that they have to go out and interview. But, you know, the students get to go and find something that inspires them. And you really do see companies across the board. And it is it is amazing to see, you know, how, how one person and one small company can make such a big difference in so many different lives. Um, it makes you feel like maybe you can do that yourself as well. I, can I add one thing? Please do. Okay. <laughs> I'll just add, you know, one other key uh, stakeholder I haven't talked about much are, are my collaborators, right? I'm first, I named the inspiration from my personal life to start Humblebee, but I'm also like standing on the shoulders of giants of, you know, black and brown organizers, working white class organizers who've rocked the facilitation game centering racial and economic justice for a long time. <laughs> um, and, and many trainers, facilitators that I've learned with and from and now practice with. Um, but so now, you know, it is interesting to, to also hold the care for collaborators as a meaningful act that the business can do, right? So I, I had made a commitment very early on in founding Humblebee, um, recognizing that, you know, for the short to midterm, I'm not going to be able financially to bring on someone else as an actual W-2 anywhere near full-time employee. Um, however, I can make a commitment to say, you know, I will pay any contractor, any subcontractor that I bring in to work with me on a project, a minimum of $50 an hour on a 990. Um, and I will talk transparently upfront with any potential collaborators or contractors about rates, about the finances of my own business and how I operate it, um, and work together to find meaningful compensation recognizing where Humblebee is now and where Humblebee might like to go, right? Um, which means often, like, I'd like for you to collaborate with me on this project. And also, perhaps we'll learn together if it feels good working together. And maybe um, you'd like to end up being involved in the conversations about a conversion process to a worker owner, uh, a worker owned cooperative, right? But it's, it's the transparency up front. It's the care up front. It's honoring someone else's ability to say no and to also say that would be okay you know, um, but to to really center that that care and commitment for those stakeholders as well, right? And it's ultimately, in some ways, a test for the business, a test for Humblebee of like, can I actually build a business in a way mechanically that is high integrity every step of the way, and for every person that we interact with on whatever level, um, and and if we can't then let's do some advocacy around that to understand like, what are the blocks? You know, that's also part of why Humblebee's <laughs> a member of the Sustainable Business Network of Greater Philadelphia, to be able to be in conversation with other um, business leaders trying to do good and, and being able to name like, what are the blocks? What are the challenges? Are there things that we might share that we can make some noise around because there's like some structures or systems broader than us uh, that do need to shift? Uh, so that continues to be true, and it continues to be a practice, but I do want to name that I'm, I'm very blessed and fortunate to, uh, to work with some beautiful comrades. Thank you, Emily. Well, I'd really like to thank all of you for being here with me today. Um, Dr. Ron Dufresne from St. Joseph's University and students James, Rose, and Anna, and the two other students that helped contribute to the story and be a part of the group that weren't able to be here with us today. Um, and Emily Weiner, thank you so much for sharing your story and Humblebee um, consulting with us. It's been a pleasure to talk to all of you and hear about your different journeys and how, the way that um, Ron's class and Emily's company have really impacted the ways that you've moved forward in your life. So thank you so much for being here with me today. It's been a complete honor. Mm -hmm.